Good evening. Good evening. Director of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, the Honorable Senator John King, Minister, of Prime, Minister in the Prime Minister's Office with responsibility for Culture and the National Development Commission, Sir Trevor Carmichael, Mrs. Sonia Marville Carter, Barbados's Council General in Toronto, Ms. Ingrid Thompson, Chief Archivist, distinguished members of the panel for this evening's event, Mr. Anthony Sherwood and Mr. Jeffrey Ward, our territory researchers, specially invited guests, members of the audience, members of the media. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to our director's evening and public campaign to locate the descendants of the second construction battalion of the Canadian Expeditionary Force of World War I. This evening's event, a special and unique one in our history, will see a viewing of the film Honor Before Glory. As part of the viewing, and it is a one hour docudrama about Canada's one and only all black military battalion, you'll get to see a little bit more of our history and indeed another facet of the page with which we have as Caribbean people indelibly marked our role and our contributions. Among other things, and not to steal any of the movie, we will witness how the unit and its members, including several Barbadians and other members of the Caribbean, overcame tremendous obstacles of discrimination to write their names indelibly and honorably on history's page. It is my very pleasant duty this evening to chair and act as the moderator for the panel. And at this time, I would like to invite the director of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society to give her opening remarks. Well, uh, thank you very much, Colonel Granham, for the kind invitation. And ladies and gentlemen, I have a very simple and pleasant duty, which is to say welcome to everyone. Uh, we are really very pleased and honored that you would join us this evening. And I, I do want to say that although it's called the director's evening, I think I share that honor <laughs> with another director, Anthony Sherwood, whose wonderful work has opened our eyes to other aspects of our national story, our regional story. And um, we could not help but support him. I think I speak for the chief archivist, our librarian, our president, Senator King. We could not help but um, want to join and support him in his endeavor to find the families of these 73 men from the Caribbean who gave their lives and their careers to this particular moment in world history. And we also note that it's in the context of the same year that our Poppy League, Barbados Poppy League will be celebrating its 100th anniversary. So it's an important occasion for all of us, but we particularly are looking forward to having all of you help us and help Mr. Sherwood to find the families of these 73 men. So thank you very much for joining us and looking forward to the resulting discussion after we see this wonderful film. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, Madam Director. At this time, I would like to graciously invite Sir Trevor Carmichael. Sir, if you would be so kind to give us some opening remarks. Thank you very much, Colonel Granham. And let me first say what a pleasure it is to be here on, on this special occasion. I think it does merit being called a director's evening. I rather like that title. It, it has a soft touch 
but it also had a touch of significance and meaning. And uh, such a combination, I think, merits this evening. But I, I am delighted to say a few words, and protocol has been observed, so I shan't repeat it and go into the time when you would rather be listening uh, to other speakers or looking at the movie. But I'm, I'm very pleased to give these remarks because the, this evening has a certain historical uh, progression. And uh, it's a progression which started actually with not just the production of the movie, but also with a conversation which I had with Senator John King after I had been in contact with Mr. Anthony Sherwood, and I'll speak about Mr. Sherwood more uh, and more significantly a little later. But it started with that conversation with uh, Senator John King. And as I said on, in another forum, I cannot remember when I have had such a warm and encouraging uh, greeting and words of encouragement uh, from someone in authority and uh, who in many respects made it happen because he alerted me to the interest which the government was interested in paying uh, to this movie and to uh, you know the, the work which is associated with it. And I say the work because there is some work associated with it and which I think we will all endeavor to perform. So I wanted to, again, I, I don't think that a repetition is necessarily boring or unnecessary. I wanted again to, to signal my thanks to, Mr. to Senator John King. And in that capacity, uh, in, or I should say, in, in re, re, speaking to him, I was acting in a capacity then as the co-founder of the Barbados Independent Film Festival because we wanted to bring the film fest, the, the film here. And I wanted to speak to Senator King first because he had been in touch with the director and producer. And I know also our very active consul general in, in, in Canada, yeah. based in Toronto, uh, Marva Carter had been also uh, very supportive. And I'm delighted that she's able to join us this afternoon. But what, what emerged from this wonderful collaboration is that the film festival returned to Barbados last month in, uh, between March 2nd to the 6th. And we held it at the Walled Garden Theatre in live and virtual formats. And, you know, the festival came back after a, a year long hiatus due to the COVID-19 pa pandemic. And we offered the sixth edition of the festival. But what we did on that occasion and what made it so very special is that we added to our overarching themes of overcoming adversity and resilience. Because after two years of the pandemic, you can very well understand that these, the films of this year reflected what one might term or what we termed a rediscovering of history. And that was the theme that we saw as appropriate so you can very well understand why this movie took on the importance for the festival that it did. As you know, history is often based on one's particular perspective and it, that is what is passed down as facts. But with our rediscovering history theme, we tried to showcase a festival of both dramas and documentaries that brought together another lens, if you will call it that, and another perspective to stories where, which we may or may not have already known. And it was in this context that we chose as our opening night film. And I say it was the opening night film, but it was indeed the highlight of the festival and the main proponent of our themes. And we chose that film, which you will see tonight, today, this evening, again, Honor Before Glory, directed by Anthony Sherwood, and you know what the story is, so I shan't repeat it.
but the Canadian High Commission was very supportive. And Chancery Chambers and the museum, uh, all three of us as, as partners in proudly sponsoring that opening night film. And it was, should I say, successfully screened and successfully shared with so many people. So today it is my pleasure to welcome back personally, sitting in the corner of the screen, my good friend, Mr. Anthony Sherwood, in what I know will be this evening's most comprehensive and far reaching launch of the many forms of enrichment which this film has produced and continues to produce. Anthony is a man of vision, a gentleman of great intellect. He embodies all in that in my mind is gracious and good and fair. And when you see this film and when the discussion unfolds as to what he has been doing, what he's done since the festival and what he continues to do, I am sure that you will be engaged in a discussion with of far reaching implications, historic viewing and the rest. So I, I, I think to say anything more would be to engage in surplus usage. And I don't want as a lawyer to be so accused. Uh, so I, I thank you all. And, and I say thanks again. And good to be here with you again, Anthony, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. I will at this time invite Senator the Honorable John King, Minister in the Prime Minister's Office with responsibility for Culture and the National Development Commission. If you would be so kind, sir, to give your opening remarks. Thank you very much, Colonel Granham, and good afternoon, everyone. First, let me apologize for being late. Um, I had, a, again, dealing with films, we have uh, some Bollywood persons on island, so I was around in a boat with them and struggling to get through the rain to get back home to get into this meeting, but I am here, so first let me accept my humble apologies. But having seen the film, um, I can tell you that there is a certain amount of excitement uh, amongst the population when you talk to people about it. I, I, I had the privilege of being able to speak to a number of people about this film, about the project itself. And um, I can tell you that in Spice Town for sure, I know of two families who are already out there checking <laughs> and, 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 and looking, looking back in their own histories. And so in at, at, the, at the archives could look out, you may get a contingent coming from Spice Town, <laughs> looking to see if their, their relatives are part and parcel of, the, of those um, soldiers. Uh, but all in all, I think when you, when you look at us as a people, and I say us, I talk about the Caribbean in itself, the diversity within it, and the many stories that we have to share with the rest of the world, I think this movie gives us another dimension. Year after year, we will celebrate, like you said earlier, Colonel Graham, Poppy Day and, you know, World War I and World War II veterans and this sort of stuff. But this was practically, uh, for me personally, totally unknown story, but one that even now um, speaks highly of the kind of character of the people that we have among us. And, and, I, and I can't wait for this movie uh, to be shared with a wider set of the Barbadian audiences because I, I know the certain monk of pride that people will have, even though it's tragic in, in some, some, some sense, but there's a certain amount of pride that you get from watching it, knowing full well that Barbarians, that Caribbean people did what they did in, at that particular point in time. And, and we've said all the challenges, but in their own way of trying. And I think that is the most important part of it all. So with those very few words, I say thank you. We are indeed grateful, for, sir, for your kind remarks and words of encouragement. And it is now my very distinct honor and privilege to introduce the members of this evening's panel of experts and guest presenters, starting of course with Mr. Anthony Sherwood. He is a producer, 
writer and director of the film, as we have heard already, Honor Before Glory. But he's also one of Canada's most successful Black actors and documentary filmmakers whose career spans over 35 years in stage, television, and motion pictures. He's received national and international acclaim for his work, having combined with such stars as Henry Fonda, Sidney Poitier, Martin Sheen, Burt Reynolds, Leslie Nielsen, Lou Gossett Jr., Megan Fox, Kathleen Turner, Jamie Lee Curtis, Christopher Reeves, and as Jessica Alba's father in the film Honey. Mr. Sherwood has worked with such illustrious film directors as Sidney Lumet, who has been nominated for five Oscars, Mr. Ted Kocheff, executive producer of Law and Order, a very popular series here in Barbados, and Mr. Michael Crichton, creator and writer of ER and Jurassic Park. He is a social activist and dynamic public speaker who has received numerous national and international awards. His production company specializes in producing documentary films dealing with social justice and human rights issues. And he has also produced and directed many successful documentary films, including Knocking on Heaven's Door, Nowhere to Run, and Mozambique, A Land of Hope. Mr. Sherwood has produced many items, many projects promoting African Canadian history. His film, Honor Before Glory, is but one of them, and is a story of Canadians, Canada's one and only all Black military battalions that was formed during World, I, World War I. The film has won a Gemini Award and a prize at the Hollywood Black Film Festival in Los Angeles. His documentary, Music, A Family Tradition, won a Gemini Award, which is Canada's most prestigious television award. And it was nominated for an International Emmy Award, while his film, 100 Years of Faith, is the story of one of Canada's oldest Black churches. And that film was featured at the Barbados Independent Film Fest Festival. Mr. Sherwood is, has a deep commitment to telling stories from African Canadian history with his and indeed our unique perspectives. He was a member of the consultant committee for the Underground Railroad exhibit at the Royal Ontario Museum and produced the original stage production entitled Follow, Follow the North Star for the Government of Canada in 2008. And that was a contribution to commemorate the 175th anniversary of the British Imperial Act of 1880, 1833 to abolish slavery in the British Empire. The show was presented in Halifax, in Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. And most recently in February, 2011, he produced several 30-second television advertisements for Black History Month for the Government of Canada. Mr. Sherwood has developed educational plays for Black History Month, including William Hall, which was presented to schools in Toronto and Halifax, and at the National Arts Centre in Ottawa. You might have well deduced that the performing arts are deeply rooted in Mr. Anthony Sherwood's family tree. Indeed, he was born in Halifax, as was his mother and grandfather. His grandmother was an accomplished musician and music teacher, his mother a singer, and his aunt was Portia White, Canada's first and most famous Black opera singer. His acting career on stage and films started in musical theater, and he starred in such musicals, musicals as Ain't Misbehaving, Cabaret, Razma Jazz, The Music Man, and recently performed in the hit musical Dream Girls at the Grand Theater in London. He's written and directed for the stage as well, including original musical productions, Ain't Got No Money in Vancouver, Once Upon a Stage, 
and Raz Majaz in Montreal. Anthony has directed and produced many successful musical concerts, including for World AIDS Day concert in 2005, which was the largest music concert for World AIDS Day in Canada. For seven years, Mr. Sherwood was also the host for the documentary series Forbidden Places on the Discovery Channel. And he also wrote and directed several episodes of Forbidden Places, that series as well which was nominated for the best documentary in Canadian television, two years in a row. Anthony was also the host and writer for the television talk show In the Black on Omni Television. In the Black was the first program on Canadian television that required exclusive interviews with prominent African Canadians. American audiences will remember him as Jackson Locke, in the popular American television series, Airwolf. For five successful seasons, he portrayed the character of Dylan Beck on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's award-winning television drama, Street Legal. And he received a Gemini Award nomination for this performance. He has also been recognized as a dedicated social activist he is the former national chairman of the March 21st campaign for the government of Canada, the March 21st campaign being that International Day for the Elimination of Racism. And he has hosted the Stop Racism concert in Vancouver with special guests, Prince Charles and members of the royal family. And in 1999, the Canada Day celebration on Parliament Hill. In 1980, he performed the first group of Black actors. He formed the first group of Black actors to lobby the television industry for greater representation of visible minority performers. We are indeed honored and privileged to have him with us, and we thank him in advance for all his work that we are going to witness this evening. The next member of the panel this evening is our own Mr. Jeffrey Ward. He is a Barit Barbadian maritime military historian who has had a lifelong passion and association with the ocean and our beautiful seas. That has led him to study the marine environment and the maritime history of the Caribbean. And he's at present completing his PhD at the University of West Indies, Cayfield investigating the maritime and naval history of Barbados in the late 18th century. Indeed, a privilege to have you with us as well, sir. And as we extend a warm welcome to the distinguished members of our panel, and as we embrace this valued opportunity to gain deeper understanding of another dimension of our proud history, I will next invite Mr. Sherwood, to give us some brief preliminary remarks before the viewing of the film. Mr. Sherwood, sir, please. Thank you, Colonel Granham. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, official dignitaries and uh, special guests. Uh, I want to thank um, Sir Trevor Carmichael and uh, Senator King for those very kind and warm uh, words, uh, affectionate words, uh, is greatly appreciated. Um, it's so nice to see some of the new friends that I made from my recent visit to Barbados. Uh, it is a friendship that I value. It is a friendship that I will cherish for the rest of my life. Um, I want to start by saying that uh, this film, Honor Before Glory, was, was made several years ago, but it was only recently that I discovered that there were 42 brave men from Barbados who played a very important part and contribution to Canada during the First World War. And uh, that was one of the reasons why I reached out to some of the officials, uh, government officials at Barbados. 
The film is, as mentioned, is a story of Canada's one and only all black military battalion formed during the First World War. It is based on the war diary of my great uncle, Captain Reverend William Andrew White, who was the chaplain for this battalion. And uh, when I read his war diary, it, uh, it really inspired me to, to tell his story on film. Uh, Captain Reverend William Andrew White was the only black chaplain in the entire British Armed Forces during the First World War. He was also one of the few black commissioned officers in the entire British Armed Forces during the First World War. He was also the first black person in Canada to receive an honorary doctorate degree from a university. Um, he was a very distinguished gentleman and it was a, it was a privilege and an honor for me to, to tell his story on film. So without further ado, uh, I'll pass it over to our moderator and uh, I hope everyone enjoys the film. Thank you, Mr. Sherwood. And at this time, I will ask our technical team to cue and allow us to view Honor Before Glory, the story of the second construction battalion known as the Black Battalion Canadian Expeditionary Force, World War I. Please enjoy. I never kept a diary before, but something is telling me that I must do it now. Things can happen in one day that can change your life forever. Our lives pass by so quickly. I guess that is why I'm taking the time to write, to write about my life, what it means, the things I've seen. No one will ever believe what I have seen. It was 1915. The war had spread across Europe, and men were dying by the thousands. There was a cry for help, and we wanted to answer the call and serve our country. I was living in Halifax at the time, and I decided to join the Army. I went to the armories and inquired. The recruiting officer informed me that I could not enlist because they were not taking any black fellows into the army. We came from poor families all across Nova Scotia, from Truro, Sydney, Spring Hill, and Africville. We all wanted to serve our country, our homeland. 
course, living in Truro, one of the more popular things to do when you was young was to go down to the railway station and go meet the troops and shake their hands. It didn't seem like the thing to do. In 1910, the Royal Canadian Navy came into being uh, by the government of Sir Wilfrid Laurier, and they set up regulations to, with respect to recruiting. And uh, what I read about it, the first, the first regulation was very explicit. It stated that all, all recruits for service in the Navy must be members of the white race. I remember in New Glasgow, a group came up from Sydney to enlist. West Indian boys and some Canadians, about 50 altogether. They went in there in the morning on the first train. They stayed until 5 p.m. Finally, they were told, this is not for you fellas. This is a white man's war. A white man's war. When they looked at us, they did not see men who were willing to die for their country. They only saw the color of our skin. I think their families had a lot to do with it as well, because they, these people had survived the great oppressions and uh, didn't want to turn back uh, to see their country being threatened um, through war. So they, they were there at the front line. They signed up or tried to sign up as uh, early as anyone else would have. Kept raising the issue and basically asking the question, why can't blacks serve their country at this time of war? The refusal to accept coloreds into the army was hurtful, but not surprising. The unwritten law of society was there was to be no mixing of coloreds and whites under any circumstances. There was talk of forming an all-colored battalion, but the response from the Department of Militia and Defense was quite clear. The fiat has gone forth. There is to be no colored line. Colored battalions are not to be raised. It would be humiliating to the colored men themselves to serve in a battalion where they are not wanted. The most resistance came from Major General Willoughby Guacan, chief of the general staff. On September 30th, 1915, he wrote the following letter. The minister is not in favor of attempting to raise a colored regiment, and I am sure he is right. In the last extremity, we might organize a company or two, but would Canadian Negroes make good fighting men? I do not think so. To maintain a regiment for 12 months in the field, we should require nearly 3,000, and perhaps a third of that number might be forthcoming. This is another of the usual dull negatives of officialdom, but I can't help it. Yours sincerely, Willoughby Guatkin. Done. Casualties were high, but still the Canadian government said no to the enlistment of colored men. The military officers, the command officers had first had complete control as to who went into their units. And the, the military authorities in Ottawa did not interfere with them. So most of them, it appeared that most of the high ranking officers did not want blacks in their unit. Letters came from all over the country to protest the barring of coloreds from the military. Letters came from Victoria, from Edmonton, from New Brunswick, and from North Buxton. So finally, as a compromise, they decided to organize a, a segregated construction battalion with white officers. On July 5th, 1916, Two years after World War I had started, the official authorization of the number two construction battalion was formally announced and the Canadian Army began to advertise for colored volunteers. My dad enlisted in St. John, New Brunswick, and I believe they took their basic training in Nova Scotia, just outside of Truro, Nova Scotia. I believe he got in early. The attitude of some of the enlisting officers was prejudicial. He said, well, why do you want to go get shot? Well, why do you want to go get shot, <laughs> you know? We came from all over Canada and the United States, 
There were over 160 Americans in our battalion. The army let us join, but they wouldn't let us fight. We were a construction battalion. They gave us shovels instead of rifles. We were a segregated unit called the Number 2 Construction Battalion. But our men didn't care. They were finally soldiers in the Canadian Army. Young black men, barely out of their teens, so eager to fight, so willing to die. They were so determined. They could get away with it a lot easier in those days with those birth certificates, you see. And so they had that um, desire to serve no matter what age. And some as young as 14 and 15 were signing up. My dad was quite young when he wanted to join the Army. He apparently just left his books and left the schoolroom and went and joined up. That was during the First World War. And that would made him either 15 or 16. But he lied his age because he wanted to be in the service so badly that he lied his age and said he was 18 when he wasn't. Too young to know the meaning of war. Too young to know the meaning of death. But they didn't care. They finally got to wear the uniform of the Canadian Army. They were going to war to prove themselves, to serve for king and country. They were no longer boys. They were men, proud men, proud soldiers, hungry for adventure, thirsty for battle. They didn't think about death. They thought about being brave, about acts of heroism, about glory, seeing the war, seeing Europe, seeing the world, seeing it all with their own eyes. Pictou, Nova Scotia was to be the headquarters for the formation of the number two construction battalion. From Picto, the colored soldiers were sent to Truro, where they were trained. Truro was a hard place to go up in Bleem Back. You went to school, you were separated. They had separate bathrooms. And then going to the theater, there was no blacks allowed to sit downstairs. They had to sit upstairs. And there were very few restaurants that you could go in to eat. So when the government went ahead and organized an all-black battalion to go overseas, when the battalion was ready to sail for overseas, Major General Guatman, he suggested that they be sent on a ship by themselves with a naval escort. We want to send overseas a labor battalion composed of Negroes with whom white troops object to travel. We should like to embark this battalion by itself due to leave Halifax, Nova Scotia on the 10th or 11th Proximo. I suppose she would be looked after as she approached home waters. The shipping company concerned is prepared to take the risk. Well, if they went overseas with a naval escort, there's a, there was a great chance that the ship would not reach England safely. Despite the opposition, the number two construction battalion got a naval escort overseas. The battalion was on its way to Europe to serve its country. We traveled by ship across the cold Atlantic Ocean. It was a long, hard voyage. Many of our men became sick. Some died. My uncle went over. I didn't realize until Calvin started to write the book. And when he was reading the nominal role, he said to me, Joyce, your Uncle Chester was over with, with, with the Black Battalion. Chester was just a young boy. He was 18 when he enlisted with a few other boys from, from Yarmouth. When they went on the ship, I don't know how long it took to go over, but they said him and another chap 
the Cromwell boy, Ben Cromwell, I think, was so sick. And by the time they got over there and they took him to the hospital, they both died. Finally, the long voyage to Europe ended. And on May 17, 1917, we landed in France. The number two construction battalion was to be stationed in La Joux, France. The train ride to La Joux was long and dreary. The rain made the journey that much more depressing. It would take two more days of travel before we reached La Joux. The army never wanted us to be a part of this war. And nobody would have ever dreamed that we would come this far to have our own battalion. The number two construction battalion had come to life. Each and every one of them was proud to be serving Canada. I know this for a fact. I know this because I was there with them. On February 27, 1917, I was appointed chaplain of the number two construction battalion. My name is William White. I arrived in my new quarters on May 19, 1917. It wasn't much, but this would be my new home until the war was over. It wasn't going to be easy living like this, away from home, away from family. How does one live without his family, without his loved ones? The number two construction battalion was assigned to the forestry corps of the Canadian Expeditionary Force. It was their job to cut lumber and build huts and help dig trenches for the white soldiers. The men cut lumber all day. It is hard, grueling work. No matter how hard our men worked, the officers never seemed to be satisfied, especially Lieutenant Hood. I said move, run! Run when I tell you to run! Never in my life have I seen such a sorry lot of military men. This is the Canadian Army. You are supposed to be soldiers. The uniforms you are wearing should be worn with pride and dignity, even though some of you are not fit to be in this battalion. Obviously, the escalation of this war has caused our government to become quite desperate. You darkies had better smarten up if you want to remain in this unit. This army will not tolerate laziness. I will not tolerate laziness. You are way behind in lumber production. Start acting like soldiers and get my lumber production where it should be. Dismissed! But we don't get no pardon. We were stationed near the Swiss border. We did logging work, getting out the logs for railroad tracks, bridges, and the trenches. At times it was pretty good. At other times it was pretty bad and pretty lonely. We worked the forestry corps in the woods, loading lumber and shipping it to the front lines. We had two or three mills going night and day. The number two construction battalion was also responsible for laying barbed wire. It was dangerous work, and their lives were at constant risk. Even though you don't see the enemy, fragmentation bombs can cause a great deal of damage. You can imagine these fragmentation bombs break into many, many pieces. It would be hot and jagged. And my dad was hit by several of these. He lost two ribs as a result of it. 
and you can imagine the experience of this such a of war continued overseas in Europe. Canadian soldiers were dying by the thousands. Regiments quickly became depleted in their numbers. But still the Canadian Expeditionary Force refused to let us fight. Major General Willoughby Guatkin, Chief of the General Staff, wrote the following memorandum. Nothing is to be gained by blinking facts. The civilized Negro is vain and imitative. In Canada, he is not being impelled to enlist by a high sense of duty. In the trenches, he is not likely to make a good fighter. October 12th, 1917. The Lord reigneth. Let the earth rejoice. The day starts fair, but always seems to end in rain. It's the usual order of things here in Lajeux. I wonder when the water supply will run out. The deeper thoughts flow from the soul. I think about the men working in this foul weather. I haven't been here long, but I already want to go back home. October 19th, 1917. Yes, it rained. No letters today. I play checkers with Private Boone. Sunday is drawing near. What shall I say? <laughs> You're quite the checker player, Private Boone. Thanks, but poker, psh, now that's my game. <laughs> I uh, noticed I haven't seen you at my uh, service on Sundays. Sorry, Chaplain. I guess I've been kind of busy. It still would be nice to see you at my services on Sunday. I'll try. You should also try and run a razor across that face once in a while. That beard is against Army regulations. This Army has too many regulations, if you ask me. Well, that's what army life is all about, following orders. Why should I follow their orders when they won't even treat us like human beings? Just because we're colored, they won't let us fight. They treat us like dirt and tell us we ain't even good enough to be real soldiers and fight for our country. This whole mess stinks. It ain't right. So why should I give a damn about their stupid regulations? Well, I just, I'd hate to see you wind up in the clink just because of a beard. This little thing here, this ain't no beard. This whole thing is my love fuzz. <laughs> Your what? <laughs> my love fuzz. Ladies love to be tickled on the back of the neck with this baby. Private Boone, in case you haven't noticed, there haven't been any ladies around here in a long time. <laughs> Well, Chaplain, you can't blame a man for having a little bit of hope. <laughs> Here is my servant. He is my chosen one. I am pleased with him. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall not cry, nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. He shall bring judgment unto truth. He will not fail. He will not be discouraged until he has set judgment onto earth. He who has created the heavens and stretched them out 
I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thy hand and will keep thee and will give thee a covenant of the people to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison houses. Let the inhabitants of the rock sing. Let them shout from the mountain tops. Let them give glory unto God and declare his praise. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. He was what I would like to consider a door opener for so many others who uh, listened to his sermons, listened to his advice. And everyone that uh, I remember uh, talking about his sermons Everyone said that he was such a powerful speaker. He was also uh, instrumental through his broadcasting on radio. He was the first black preacher to uh, broadcast across Canada and in the northern part of the United States. His principal church was the Cromola Street Baptist Church. The church was packed and they were all or nearly all black people. Now, I had never seen that many in my life. And you could hear him preach. And I, was, I always say you could hear him down Snooks's Corner. I think that's a bit of an exaggeration. But he was loud to my ears and powerful, excellent speaker. And then to see all these people, I think I must have stood with my mouth open. <laughs> it was something. But it, it was a, a nice introduction into the community. On October 22nd, 1917, Private Brent gave out on his way to work. They push our men to the point of exhaustion. The more things change, the more they remain the same. They don't care how hard they work our men. We are usually the last ones on the list to get army supplies. Sometimes the men don't even get underwear or socks. Without socks, the men's feet became full of blisters and sores. I miss the children. I miss their laughter and holding them in my arms. Is there nothing that can take away the emptiness I feel in my heart? Lord, am I doing the right thing, leaving my family alone? He was a gentle man, you know, and uh, just so loved his children so much. He was just the greatest uh, individual that I believe I've ever met. He had a love for his children and, and for people generally that I have not seen in any other human being. Private Brent was unable to walk because of the sores on his feet. He stayed in bed for three days. Why must they push our men so hard? Most of the medical officers refused to look after our men with the exception of one doctor Captain Dan Murray. My grandfather wanted to be part of that battalion specifically and went to Halifax, um, spoke to Dan Sutherland, who was a friend, who was a close friend, and managed to get on to that battalion. And 
He stayed with that battalion for the most part throughout the war. You seem to be spending a lot of time with those darkies. You're supposed to be taking care of our men. These are our men. And don't you ever tell me how to do my job, Colonel. November 6, 1917. It was damp and cold, so I decided to stay inside and read my Bible when I had an unexpected visit from Colonel Johnson. It's usually customary for a soldier to rise when his commanding officer enters a room. Where I come from, it's usually customary to knock before entering someone's room. I came to tell you Sunday service will only be one hour. The troops will be moving out then. You're awful young to be a colonel. Are you a family man? And what I lack in years, I make up for in experience, which is more than I can say about you and your men. My men and I have every right to be here. We'll see about that. The troops will be moving out in four hours. It was a warm autumn day, so I went for a walk in the woods to stretch my legs. I spend too much time cooped up in my quarters. I need to get out more and enjoy the beauty that God has created. Most of the fellow officers treat me all right, but it was awkward being the only colored person in the officers' quarters. I know some of the officers don't like me. I never know when one will barge in and check up on me. One minute. Come in. I'm not disturbing you, am I? <laughs> Private Boone. What can I do for you? Well, Christmas is coming up, and I was hoping to send something back for my mom, and I, I got 70 francs here. I was, I was wondering if you could hold on to it for me. Sure. I'll uh, log it in my diary. Thank you. You have a good night, Private Boone. You too, Captain. Good night. Some of the men think of me as their personal banker. I find myself using my diary as an account ledger to keep track of everyone's savings. The men put so much trust in me. I hope they put as much trust in the Lord. November 22nd, 1917. Three boys went absent from 21 Company. Where could they have gone? To fight or to desert? November 23rd, 1917. It rained again today. Why does it rain so much? Why the heart searchings? The pain of not being able to fully enjoy the companionship of our friends. I must write a letter to a friend tonight. After so much rain, it was nice to finally see the sun. Life is sunshine and shadows. I went to a concert in the evening where the number two construction battalion band was playing. The band is doing just fine. My grandfather was very, um, entranced with the music 
these orchestras, you know, the, the he called it the colored orchestra of the, the number two battalion. And his letters are filled with what wonderful music it was and how special they felt in the mess hall. My dad played an E-flat tuba in the number two construction battalion band. He liked music, so I guess it was a long, determined period of little groups of them getting together and learning their music to perfection. December 24th, 1917. Christmas Eve. It was chilly, so I made myself a cup of tea. Dad, thought I'd bring you a little Christmas cheer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Lord knows this place could use it. I uh, brought you something, it being Christmas and all. Hey, you didn't have to do that? I know, but you've been very good to the boys, and I wanted to show you my appreciation. Well, that's awfully kind of you, William. Thank you, William. I will treasure this always. Uh, I just made some tea. Would you like to join me? Yeah. Or uh, we could have something stronger if you prefer. Hey, it's the holiday season. It's time to celebrate. <laughs> All right. Here you go. William White and my grandfather, Dan Murray, I think were very similar. And of course, they would have seen one another a great deal because uh, Reverend White and my grandfather would have done rounds together in the hospitals and sick bays. He would have gone to the wounded men. He would have, uh, they would have been together a great deal. December 25th, 1917. Christmas in France. I went to the hospital and visited the men. The men had turkey. Officers were entertained. Canadian nurses were invited for dinner. Thirteen at the table. Speeches by all present. I rode icy. The war still goes on, and the men continue to work hard cutting lumber. Seventy Company cuts 155,000 feet of lumber. A record. All right. Put my money down. Put my money down. The men are getting restless. They want a taste of war, but they are a construction battalion and not allowed to fight. So they started to fight amongst themselves. It started with a crap game. Heated words were exchanged and then pistol shots. Nobody was hurt. April 23rd, 1918. The resentment of not being allowed to fight is starting to wear on the men. One of our men, J. L. Sullivan, an American, threatened a white officer with a knife. He is thrown in jail. April 27th, 1918. It was quite late, and the men were still working outside. When will this nonsense stop? May 30th, 1918. There was a court-martial for J. L. Sullivan. Majors Hanberg, Legere, and Lang formed the court. Sullivan was sent to prison for five years. The men are starting to succumb to the hard work in the rain and snow. Private Boone is very sick. Dan Murray came to take care of him. Murray is the only doctor who will come to our barracks and look after our men. He was a caring man. He loved people. Uh, he was a very committed doctor. Uh, it was not just a career. It was an obsession. 
Private Boone is still very sick. Captain Murray returns to take care of him. Murray's a good man. The mixing of coloreds and whites was the Army's biggest fear. They thought it would result in chaos. I guess they would never understand our friendship with Dan Murray. My family has been colorblind. Uh, it always was. My grandfather was colorblind. My father was colorblind. Um, everyone in my family. It didn't occur to us that anyone was any different. Thanks for coming. I'm sorry. Private Boone had passed away. It is sad to see someone who enjoyed life so much die so young. I conducted Private Boone's funeral. Boone was buried in an unmarked grave. No tombstone. No inscription to say who he was or who will miss him. I will miss him. Dear Isaac, I miss you more as each day passes. I miss your touch, your warmth, your kiss. How can I ever live without you? Andrew and Izzy were married when she was very young. I understand only 15. And he was quite a bit older than she was. I think he was about 30. But by all accounts, it was a very successful and happy marriage. And he really loved her a lot. My mother, I believe, was a remarkable woman in that recognized, first of all, that she was the mother of her 13 children, married extremely young, and I believe didn't have the opportunities that young girls generally enjoy, uh, but took on the role of a minister's wife and, and uh, played that role extremely well. Today it was clear and cold. I was busy packing up. Time was very short before we had to go away. I got orders to go with Captain Morrison and Lieutenant Hood and 200 men to another part of France. Our men were always on the move, always traveling from one place to another without much rest. <coughs> What's wrong, Mansfield? I don't feel so good. <coughs> I got the chills. What's going on here? Mansfield is sick, sir. That's nonsense. He looks fine to me. Get up, Mansfield. We've got a train to catch. Yes, sir. I told you he was sick. Dad, get up, you lazy bastard. I told you to get up now, soldier. He can't get up, sir. Listen, I will not be deceived by this trick. He is faking. Get up, Mansfield. I am ordering you to get up, soldier. I told you to get up. Get your hands off me, boy. Or I will have you court-martialed. Move out. Come on, Mansfield. Come on. Help me! Today, Dr. Murray had to leave for Champagnon. This couldn't have happened at a worse time. Private Mansfield was very sick. He's burning up with fever. Let's get him to the hospital. It is late, but I cannot sleep. I keep thinking of Private Mansfield about deeper experiences of life. Is this what we fought so hard for? Dear God, do you not see how we have suffered? I hope Private Mansfield will be all right. 
Mansfield returned from the hospital. The doctors say he is faking and refuse to look after him. The next day, Private Mansfield had taken worse. I read and prayed with him. We tried to take him back to the hospital, but the doctors still think he is faking. This wouldn't have happened if Captain Murray was here. I am lonesome. I love, I want Izzy and the kids. Lord knows I love my little wife and those kids. God bless and keep them. Private Mansfield died at 9.50 a.m. the following day. Now the doctors know he is not faking. Mansfield was buried this morning. When will our men stop dying so needlessly? All it would have taken to save him was a little human kindness. It is nice to be dead and out of it. I used to think that I did not want to die. But when work and worry get a hold of you, death is sweet. Boy, you're an easy victim. Didn't you learn any defensive strategy since you've been in the army? Sorry, Dan, I guess my mind isn't on the game. What are you thinking about? I was thinking that maybe I should have never insisted that my boys get involved in this war. Why do you say that? All I've brought them is pain, suffering, death. War can be a terrible thing, but sometimes you have to fight for what you believe in to make things right. William, you've given your men a chance to do just that. I've seen death more times than I care to remember. You never get used to seeing a life pass before your eyes. Your boys did not die in vain. They came here and they served their country with pride and dignity. And history can never take that away from them. June 10th, 1918. I went to the hospital in Champagnon. Hall and Cromwell are very sick. Five days later, Cromwell dies in hospital. On June 18th, I went to Champagnol to bury him. June 28th, 1918. I was married 12 years ago today. I love Izzy more than ever. How is he? It doesn't look good. We had one more casualty in our battalion. <sighs> Lieutenant Hood had become ill with pneumonia. You're the last person I expected to see here. I've come to pray for you. Pray? I don't think I'm gonna make it. 
Try not to talk. Save your strength. Why are you doing this? There are times when a man should never be alone. I'm afraid to die. Please don't let me die. Please don't let me die. The Lord is with you. And I'll be here with you as long as you need me. Our Father, Our Father. who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Death has no prejudice. It takes life indiscriminately, without warning, without compassion. It was August, 1918, and the Germans were suffering severe losses. The end of the war was in sight. There was talk of no longer needing the number two construction battalion. They never wanted us in the first place. After all we've been through, after all they've done to us, they were ready to throw us away like unwanted trash. So on August the 11th, 1918, I wrote a letter to Sir Robert Borden asking that the number two construction company be given back the original establishment of a battalion. My letter to Sir Robert Borden was passed on to the major private secretary of the military defense department. These niggers do well in Forestry Corps and other labor units. I think that if you in Ottawa consider that by converting it into a battalion, it'll rouse such enthusiasm among the colored population of Canada as to lead them to flock to the colors, our authorities here might be induced to try the experiment. However, now that America has come into the war, most of these darkies, if they're doing any flocking at all, will flock to where the better pay is, namely the American army. They had no more use for us, so the number two construction battalion was to be disbanded. Our brief stint as Canadian soldiers was to come to an end. On September 23, 1918, we received a dispatch reporting that the body of one of our men was found on Road 45 to Salin. The soldier's name was Charlie Song. It was presumed he was a victim of murder. According to the post-mortem report, Solm's body had numerous incisions, which were made by a sharp instruments such as a knife. On his face, chest, back, and neck, Solm's throat was also cut, severing the carotid artery, jugular vein, and respiratory tract. The police had a suspect, but neither the suspect nor anyone else was charged with the crime. October 1918, the end is finally near. Our troops are predicting a victory, but not before we lose two more men. On October 21st, 1918, Private Hall died in Champignon Hospital. And on November 3rd, Mike Jackson died. On November 10th, 1918, Sunday afternoon, right after my sermon between four and five o'clock, Private Wallace and two of his comrades reported to me that they had found the body of Private Sidney David lying at the bottom of a cliff. He had been dead for over a week. A court inquiry was held and nine individuals gave testimony. Curiously, the reconstruction of the events around David's death is incomplete and the inquiry's conclusions are questionable. 
The next day, we buried Sidney David at Champagnon, our last burial. The biggest war the world had known had come to an end, and the number two construction battalion was there to make its mark and to make history. So many lives lost, so little gratitude given. I hope Dan was right. I hope they did not die in vain. After the war, I never did see Dan Murray again. But strange things often happen long after you are gone. Welcome to my humble home. <laughs> Goodness gracious. What a surprise. You're so right. <laughs> My gracious. When I read the diary, I had no idea who Dr. Murray was. I mean, absolutely no idea at all. The relationship that existed long before you and I even were born. Well, I, f I found out about it probably a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. My brother Bruce called, mm -hmm. and he said, you've got to hear this story. Well, Lauren White and... My sister Anne uh, have known one another for 35 years since the sing-along Jubilee days. But they didn't know that they had any other connection than sing-along Jubilee. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago um, when you were searching for um, you know, this elusive Captain Murray, who was uh, cited many, many times in the uh, William White's uh, diary, that they discovered that Captain Murray, who spent a lot of time with Lauren's father, was my grandfather and was Anne's grandfather. Yeah. And in the end, he said, and guess who his son is? And I said, well, who's his son? He said, Lauren White. Oh, and yeah. And, and I, I just heard, about oh, died. I was very pleased and happy that he would have had this relationship with William White because I knew that uh, in my heart of hearts that he was the type of man that uh, would not be prejudiced. He never ever said anything about anybody. And if he did, it was usually a story that he would tell and he would laugh. He had a great sense of humor. As a granddaughter, I'm as proud as I could be. I'm proud to be his granddaughter because he was obviously very strong and his own man and uh, stood up for what he thought was right. And um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, there's no better man. I think it was a revelation to him about uh, the black community too because he probably never met a black man before he joined that regiment or that battalion. He certainly wouldn't have met any black man like William White. My father died on September the 9th of 1936. I had never seen my mother cry. The phone rang. Uh, my mother answered. I, along with my brothers and sisters, knew that something was happening and I saw my mother cry for the very first time, and I knew that my father was dead. I can recall my brother Bill telling me that the funeral was going to be televised and, and uh, that I was not allowed to cry. And so we all went to the Cornwall Street Baptist Church. The, the church was packed. Hundreds and hundreds of people were outside the church wanting to get in and, of course, could not. My dad's funeral was probably the largest funeral that Halifax had ever seen up to that point. Uh, he had the respect of the ministers throughout the entire province. The thing that struck me most was the number of people lining the streets of Halifax uh, just to see and uh, this final or say their final goodbye to my father. It was just remarkable. The Halifax papers were, the front page was just loaded with uh, stories and, and uh, the uh, sentiments of, of the community at his loss. And uh, 
it was just the most tremendous thing for me to, as a young boy, to know, and then for the next 50 years to hear people make reference to him. It was just amazing. <laughs> The annual event at Picto, in celebration of the number two construction battalion, I think really sets the tone for these unsung heroes to be finally given their just due. It's the first of its kind, probably in the, in the Dominion of Canada. I'd go on the limb and say that it is definitely the first of its kind. Five years ago, we had the first one. And there's a large, very large crowd of people around here that day, and, we're, and uh, we, we unveiled the, the monument and the cenotaph there, and, the, and the, of course the depicting plaque. It's been a kind of a favorite celebration of ours ever since. It was it was exciting uh, to find out that we had, you know, we had this black battalion, Canada's one and only black battalion, trained here in the town of Picto. People became aware that blacks served, fought, bled, and died on battlefields, all in the name of freedom. I think prior to the Picto ceremony, this wasn't commonly known among many people, among people. They were surprised to know that black people had served their country overseas. History is what it amounts to, because I think these young men, and some of them were so very young that went overseas, to think that they went through so much in order to get in. It's something for black people to be proud of, their, what their ancestors did. Yes, we were a part of it. Our family was a part of it. And I can still look back and read about it and say, yes, my dad was a part of that. And I said, I don't let no man tell you that any other man is braver than a black man because he's got what it takes, and he's proved it, even though he didn't get the credit for what he'd done. He went there, he trained like a soldier, he fought like a soldier, and he died like a soldier. And that's all any man can do. Now I know why I had to record everything I've seen, everything I've done so people will never forget the good old number two. So that they will know we were here, giving our lives for honor and glory.
In the words of Marcus Garvey, a people without knowledge of their past history, origin and culture is like a tree without roots. And I'm certain that witnessing the excellent work of Mr. Sherwood in the film just now has helped us to see, to know and to understand another aspect of our journey as a Caribbean people. As we transition to the question and answer segment of today's event, uh, just a brief reminder of our distinguished panel. Of course, Mr. Anthony Sherwood, the producer, writer and director of the film. And we can see from the film why he is one of Canada's most successful Black actors and documentary filmmakers. Mr. Jeffrey Ward, Barbadian maritime and military historian. And we are also joined by the research team comprised of Ms. Alessandra Cummings, Ms. Karen Proverbs, and Dr. Shani Roper. I will invite at this time remarks from the panelists, starting of course with Mr. Sherwood. And thereafter, we shall have the question and answer segment. Mr. Sherwood. Thank you, Colonel Grenham. Uh, I'm just trying to come uh, connect with my video, but it won't allow me to connect by a video. Uh, I'll try once again, no. There we go, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, you know, when I first brought the film to Barbados Independent Film Festival, I didn't know how they would react. You know, they could have easily said, well, it was uh, an interesting film, uh, thank you for coming, goodbye, but they didn't. They embraced it and they embraced my attempts to find descendants in Barbados and the generosity and the kindness bestowed upon me by Sir Trevor Carmichael and the staff of the Barbados Independent Film Festival was so heartwarming and so encouraging that it made me feel like an adopted son of Barbados. And I was so taken by their enthusiasm to take part of this project of finding descendants. And they embraced the project with such enthusiasm and such dedication that it was so heartwarming for me. So, so I, I really was so optimistic about their, their enthusiasm for us trying to find descendants. And you know, when the government of Canada first allowed Blacks to join the Canadian military and to form this battalion, they were concerned that they wouldn't find enough Canadian Black men to form a full battalion of 700 men. So that's why they enlisted Black men from all across Canada, the United States, and the Caribbean, because they wanted to make sure they got enough Black men to fulfill this battalion. And so in my research, I discovered that there were 73 men from the Caribbean, but the majority of them came from Barbados. There were 42 men from Barbados who joined the number two construction battalion. And that's why I was so happy that Barbados embraced this project of finding the descendants. This is a historic year because the government of Canada is going to be issuing a formal apology to the descendants and the black soldiers of the number two construction battalion. This year on July 9th, the prime minister of Canada will be issuing a formal apology. So the timing of this is so important. It took 104 years for the government of Canada to finally issue an apology. And it's going to happen this year in July. And it, today is actually an historic day today as well, because this morning, the Minister of Defense of Canada 
finally released a report, an extensive report on the racial discrimination in the Canadian military and how we need to eliminate it. That report was released this morning. And uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll share the link later on, the media link of that report. And once that report becomes declassified or unclassified by the government, I'll make sure I get a copy of that report to distribute uh, to, to, uh, to the Barbados Museum. But so this is a historic, these are historic times for, for this particular part of history, for this particular part of Barbados. The Barbados Museum has a military museum attached to it. And I had the opportunity and the chance to get a tour of that museum. And I discovered that on their roll of honor from the men of Barbados who served in World War I, there is a name of a Barbados soldier who served with the number two construction battalion. His name was Private Elliot Belfield Hall, who I mentioned in the film. And I was so surprised to see his name on that uh, honor roll in the military museum at the Barbados Museum. And the, also the thing is, is that the strange thing is, is that I had an opportunity to visit his grave in France. In 2018, I was invited by the government of France to come to France for the unveiling of a special monument for the black soldiers, Canadian black soldiers who died in France. And I was there for the unveiling of this monument in France to these black Canadian soldiers. And there are 10 names. There are only 10 names on that monument, the soldiers who died in France. And one of those names was Private Elliot Belfield Hall from Barbados. So the country of Barbados is represented on that special monument in France. And uh, it has been a, such a, a pleasure for me to work with the people uh, in Barbados, with the Barbados Museum, to work with Sir Trevor Carmichael and, and, and Senator King, because they've embraced me with such warm hospitality and such dedication and devotion to understanding my attempts to find these descendants in Barbados. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sherwood. Mr. Ward, sir, your remarks. Good evening, everybody. Um, I had four, four main points that I wrote down. I, first off, Mr. Sherwood, that was one of the best military documentaries I have seen in a very long time. There are way too many military documentaries that they dehumanize everything. And it, it was really a, a touching human story. And it, it was about humanity. And I, I think you really should give yourself a, a pat on the back and deserve every accolade that I've heard so far, because it, it, was, it was a very good documentary. Um, the second one is, is uh, very short. If the soldiers of the second were under fire, laying where they were in combat, as far as I see it. To say that they, they were not, to go into combat and not be able to fight back, to do things as important as lay wire, that is a special type of bravery and it should be acknowledged as such. The third one is um, what Sandra Rock was saying. It, the soldiers, should be very proud of what they were doing. Now, most people think of soldiers and combat and fighting, but the reality is 10% of, of actual soldiers generally going to combat. Everybody else is in a supporting role. And they were involved in one of the most important roles with the forestry, the First World War, what was one of the most important logistical resources, and they should be very proud of what they did with that. And the fourth one comes to the social um, control because the story resonated to me, not only with 
what the second faced. But how other units, black units within the British Empire faced the exact same thing. And it was the, the use of black troops in Europe was, was very, very limited unless um, it was by the French who used quite a lot. But in the British Empire, it was very uh, limited. And I, I really think this has to do with um, a distinct effort of social control. The Americans had a song in 1918, how can you keep them on the farm once they've seen Paris? And it's the same thing. I, I do not think many people were worried about the second and other, the, the West India, um, British West Indies Regiment doing badly. I think they were very worried about them doing very well, particularly in Europe. And this was shown in, in Palestine um, where the West India Regiments did very well. Now, to, to put that in context, when we're talking about the First World War in 1916, it is at the very end of living memory of slavery. So the abolition of slavery to 1916 is like us talking about the Battle of Britain today in 1940, uh, 1940 it's the same amount of time. Um, and that, that really is my last point. The, the social control, I think it is very interesting, very interesting indeed. And having done and a very small amount of research, because I, I only saw the film a few days ago for the first time. The incidents of discipline and court martial while in France were so low compared to the amount of time that the second was in theater and the hard, thankless work they did and the social bigotry that they faced. So the actual lack of disciplinary proceedings Again, it speaks very, very well for them. Um, I think they're the main ones, and if people want to ask questions later. Thank you, um, Mr. Ward. Uh, very interesting comments, including the highlight of the role of engineers and construction battalions in warfare, uh, the provision of countering mobility that is any method or means to stop the advance of the enemy, laying wire and so on, as we saw. Uh, Miss Proverbs, would you like to provide your comments at this time? Good afternoon, Mr. Sherwood. I have to say this was an excellent video. Keep up the good work. In conducting this research, I found that only three persons give the correct dates of birth. And those were Walton Rochford, Jarvis Brown, and Garnet Cox. Only the three of those gave correct details pertaining, pertaining to their dates of birth. But what I've found is that out of the 42 Barbadians, only 15 were accounted for here in the records at the archives. And since only three gave the correct birth dates, it meant that 12 sent me on a wild goose chase. So I had to look beyond those dates that were provided. Some of them even gave incorrect surnames. Mm -hmm. For instance, if the mom was married, they gave her maiden name as opposed to the married name because you usually find persons based on the dad's name once you're married. But all in all, I enjoyed doing the research. I must say that based on what we received, two persons were brothers, Julian and Ernest Bradshaw. The two of those were brothers. Unfortunately, they were not found, but I did find two others that were brothers who gave misleading information on the documentation, which they would have provided to the military. The same Belfield Elliott Hall, to whom Mr. Sherwood alluded to earlier, I found him, but not as Belfield Elliott, I found him as Elliott Belfield Halls. So there's an S to his hall. And his brother, was Dudley the Costa Halls. 
So there were some interesting things that I found mm -hmm. in conducting this research. On Belfield's baptism, he said that, sorry, on his military card, he said that his mom was Melvina Belfield. I thought that strange. On the Costa's baptism, it gives his mother as Ethel Linda, two separate names, Paul. But both of them were from Bowling Alley. So when I found the baptisms, I realized that they both had the same mother. She's Ethel Linda, that is one word, as opposed to the two separate words found, found on the regiment card. So she's Ethel Linda Malvina Halls. They were from Vaughan's in St. Joseph. So those two were not flagged as brothers to what we received, but I discovered through the research that they were brothers. Um, what we also discovered is that usually when persons are immigrating, they, they tell you lies about the ages. And this was alluded to by two of our presenters earlier. So if you were really young, you would give an older, older date of birth. Mm -hmm. So I believe that is the reason why these, some of these 27 persons haven't been found. I also observed that there were some names that are not common to Barbadian um, heritage and our landscape. There was a surname, Augustus. We know that Augustus is usually a Christian name as opposed to a surname. And there was a Christian name, Hicks, H-I-C-K-S. To me, that sounds like a, what we call a pseudonym, a nickname. So some of them were not found based on these underlying factors. But I believe it's a work in progress and I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep pushing on to find those 27 persons that are unaccounted for. So thank you for having us. Thank, thank you, and a very, very encouraging. Miss. Yes, Colonel, Colonel Granham, I just want to say, um, Ingrid Thompson here, um, just want to say we're happy to be a part of the project. Um, Jessica Oda Burrell and Senator John King, any two persons that would have um, brought the project to our attention. Um, Senator King is always um, ready and eager with all these projects in relation to our culture and heritage. And he always made sure that he involved the archives um, into it. Cause you know, genealogy is, is our business. And since after watching the documentary um, just now, we're more determined than ever to find these men because they need to be honored in a formal way and to be remembered. And I was quite happy because we usually get a lot of stories um, in terms of ancestry from the USA and the UK and not really anything from Canada. Um, you know, we, we have a register of um, poor white women who emigrated to Canada, Canada early in the 20th century, but we don't have projects like this coming out from out of Canada. So I was very heartened in terms of what Mr. Sherwood is doing. And that's just a tip of the iceberg. I'm sure that um, our Consul General will, will come up with some ideas and, and work with the archives and Senator King at the Division of Culture in relation to other projects going forward to make sure that we can have that connection, our ancestry, we have a very large diaspora. And we also want to make sure that we document everything and make that information available. And even in terms of conducting the research, what we would have found out that All Souls Church and by Hall, that was established in 1920. And it said it was named after in commemoration for those who died in World War I. And that was something that I did not even know myself in terms of that, that church. So we look forward to work, working with everybody, Mr. Sherrod, the museum, 
and all the others in terms of carrying the project forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Very interesting um, anecdote there on All Souls Church. And I, I think overall, I share the enthusiasm and it's, it's very, very tangible as we go forward. Um, Ms. Cummings, would you care to share any additional comments? Thank you. I think I'd rather wait until Dr. Roper's had a chance because I have to say Karen has given all kinds of wonderful information and I'm just backing up at the stage for another person. But uh, Dr. Roper would be good to hear from her. Thank you. Yep. Yes, Hi. please. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me in this um, event this evening. I want to just celebrate, you know, the importance, the kinds of interventions that can be made by film in the in reflecting on the past. And I, I really think that if one wanted to reflect a little bit more um, in the classroom space um, and in public history spaces like this about the um, World War I um, participants um, from the Caribbean and their treatment and the ways in which persons of African descent were treated, um, but also the ways in which diaries and recollections and memory are important to the reconstruction of the past. I really think that this was just really a very useful experience. Um, so I would like to do some preliminary reflections. Unfortunately, um, uh, Alessandro had sent this to me um, in our network of museums about finding ways to engage, um, to find out information about Jamaican descendants who, the descendants of Jamaicans who worked in the second battalion. Um, my preliminary work in terms of reaching out to my colleagues has not been successful. I haven't gotten any feedback yet. And one of the things to point out, and I like that um, the ways in which the arch archivists have kind of clarified some of the peculiarities about navigating this kind of research, because one of the things that we need to think about, especially in Jamaica, is the significantly larger um, internal migration that happens and the movement within parishes in trying to locate um, families in addition to wrong names. Um, some people give their names not knowing that that's not the name on their birth certificate, for example, or they give their birth date not knowing that they were registered a year or two late. That's a practice that's specific to the Caribbean and navigating the issues in the Caribbean. Um, and so unfortunately, I don't have the kind of intricate <laughs> data to provide, but I have, um, begun the process of sharing the information with colleagues. I have reached out to the military museum as well. We have our own monuments in Jamaica to um, persons who fought in World War I, well not fought, but participated in World War I. Um, and I, we, I, just in terms of speaking with my colleagues, do require us to do a little like back tracking to kind of figure out even with some of the names that are on the monuments, if there's a possible correspondence in terms of where they were. But this also requires a lot of um, a kind of a, a, a time, a kind of time affordability to kind of sit down and, and comb through um, archives that are, are not, um, people are not necessarily adhering to what would be the standards of the archive for that period. So, um, but even if we are not successful, potentially not successful in terms of with the timeline, I do think that it opens the door for us to think very critically about um, memory and the archive and the ways in which um, Jama our Caribbean um, ancestors really gave people, you know, a, a kind of a white lie to get what they wanted and what the implications are for us in terms of our research. But again, I just want to celebrate um, this, this um, docudrama 
and that, you know, I'm grateful for this opportunity. I will definitely be pointing it out to my colleagues because I think it's a very effective teaching tool as well about World War I and the legacies, especially if you're reading about the decolonizing moment and even thinking about memorials in the Caribbean around participation in the world wars. I think this is a very important um, thing to add to, to that discussion. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Roper. At this time, we are free to open the general floor for, for comments, for questions. The chat is indeed quite busy and we are already getting some information with regard to Julian and Ernest Bradshaw. And I've encouraged the contributor to get in contact with us, with the Barbados Museum and Historical Society to help with the coalition. And, and the archives. <laughs> Sorry? And the ar both the museum and the archives, because we have both right, the museum to and comment. the archives. Thank mm -hmm. you, thank you. And some other comments have come in as well for Mr. Ward on the quantum of court martials might be recast or reflective in light of the severity of punishments that were handed out. Mm -hmm. uh, more importantly, that the quantum is unimportant when juxtaposed against the murders or what the movie suggests might have been such. So we want to hear from the many that have come to take part in this evening's historic event and to indeed view a work of art, an excellent movie, Honor Before Glory. So the floor is open for any questions to be put to any member of the panel. Um, you're free to go ahead and do so. Colonel Granham, before we open the floor completely, May I share my screen because while Karen has given a, a, a great review of what has so far been found, I wanted to contribute uh, from, not so much from my perspective because uh, Harriet Pierce and her team are going to get going with this project as well, but from actually a Barbadian based in Canada, uh, a genealogic researcher who has looked a little bit at the archive. So if I may share my screen, please. Um, is that okay? Yes, Can yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, please. Okay. All right. um, mm -hmm. Technical team. Um, where is it gone? Uh, document two. I think that we haven't got... This is, this is to follow up with what um, my colleague was saying, what Karen was saying about uh, misinformation, and but also literally inaccurate information. So for example, if you looked very simply at some of the documents or how they've been transcribed, they would read Redmond Village instead of Redmond's Village. Um, uh, St. Andrew's Paris is St. Andrew's. We would, we would understand that coming from a Barbadian background, but not necessarily those working in Canada. Mount Dacis or is actually Mount Dacre's. Long Bay Paris is actually Long Bay St. Philip Paris. Uh, Six Rose St. Philip. Um, be, not being the sixth road. And um, there were some other highlights that I'd like to share. Can you see the screen? The, um, this information? Yes, I can. Okay, so, so it's, it is, I think, backing up and endorsing some of the points made by um, the archives. But uh, uh, I have to say that uh, Mercat Wilshire in Canada has been particularly supportive and generous in doing research in his time. He couldn't unfortunately join us 
On today's date, we had um, initially signaled a different date, um, but he has followed up and prepared these kinds of documenting uh, further on the, the various names provided for the individual. So at some point um, between the material that the archives has found and that and Ernest Wilshire has found, and then the continuing, I, I am really pleased to see the um, material coming forward from uh, members of the public in the uh, chat. This is going to be extremely important in helping us to tell these stories. So here's information about um, the parents of Lloyd Byer um, on Edmund Sinclair Bullard, and then uh, the parents of that person. Um, and Edric Granville Cullimore. I um I think what we're gonna do, uh, Karen and Ingrid, is marry the information you've got to these records and then share them so that we've all got as full a data as possible. Um Alexander Alonzo Collimore. Garnet Wolsey Cox, Joseph Nathaniel Cox uh, is the father's name. Um, the mother's name is Margaret Jane Bailey. So we've got, we, we are building the backgrounds to a number of these people. Now, Elliot Belfield Halls is mentioned here with the correct, the, the, the data that Karen has found um, and we, and that's been pulled together very carefully by, um, as I said, by Mercat Wilshire. Um, but it's interesting to see that the, the that he has gone back further than beyond the parents to the grandparents in some instances. And we're hopeful that this will help us move forward to the other generations that followed. If you consider that many of these were young men who may not have married, may not have had family. So we're not looking so much for the children or grandchildren per se, but the uh, great nieces and nephews and um, aunts and uncles and, and cousins that might have related. Um, that would have been a reality of their situation as well. Then I, I want to show one last part of the documentation that um, Mercat Wilshire had supplied. And that would be, let's see here. Okay, so, wait a minute. Uh, 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 here we go. So he has now, um, pull together some of the documentation um, that would have been uh, available. And this is the kind of information I think, Karen, you, you would have had, if not the actual original documentation. Um, so that we, we can pull together all kinds of information not just about the individuals, but the conditions of work and labor and living lifestyles in certain parts of the island. I believe what we might find also, given the sheer number of individuals, is a pattern of people coming from specific parts of Barbados and perhaps traveling together or being recruited together. I think also, um, I, I would be so bold as to say that it might be important for us to look also at the records of uh, the North American men who were recruited because some of these would have been Caribbean men who had already moved to either uh, the United States or um, 
or Canada, specifically Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia was welcoming, um, if if you can use that word, Caribbean men um, from the 18, at least the 1870s, 1860s in terms of the fishing industry, the whaling industry, mining, um, all kinds of different occupa occupations, which as Jeff pointed out, you know, after emancipation, what did you do? Where did you go? You were constantly looking for better ways to live your life. And some of these people were already in uh, North America at the time that the recruitment was being called. I think I'll leave it there for the time being. And I just say that I'm so sorry that our colleagues from Guyana weren't able to join us today because uh, we, we had similarly shared those documents with them. Uh, for their uh, group, I think it's about 12 individuals uh, from Guyana were found. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. And we certainly look forward to their contributions as well. If I can switch to some questions put in the chat. The first I'd like to relay from a Mr. David Weeks to Mr. Sherwood. And he points out there is a nuance here that begs a question of you as the producer. And the question goes on to ask, has much changed since 1918 for the black man, given what you have seen in the inclusion of policies of the establishment and how we die now in similar obscurity, not by bullets like the soldiers in the featured battalion or by quiet lynchings evidenced by the post-war killings, but by new variants of a more quiet, acceptable dealership in death. To colored people. What, Mr. Sherwood, might be your response to Mr. Weeks's question? Thank you uh, for the question, Mr. Weeks. You sound like an author and poet. Uh, um, I, I, as I mentioned, there was a report released this morning by the Minister of Defense of Canada, who specifically states in the report that there is severe racial discrimination today in Canadian military. And they're trying to find ways to eliminate racial discrimination. One of the issues is that there are people joining the Canadian military who have backgrounds of white supremacy. And there have to be a better job of rooting out some of these potential recruits uh, doing better background checks. So. Uh, it, uh, racial discrimination is still exists. Uh, Anti-black racism exists in all levels of society in Canada. Canada is a great country to live in, but we we do have our faults, and uh, it's it's systemic. It exists in all levels of society, in politics, in the armed forces, in education, uh, in the private sector. It, there, there is anti-black racism everywhere. So it still exists today. The, uh, the Canadian uh, military is aware. Uh, I'm proud, I'm, I'm happy that they issued this, this report this morning uh, and, and admitted there was uh, problems of racial discrimination still existing in the Canadian military. So uh, there'll be further developments. And uh, as I mentioned, as soon as this report becomes declassified or unclassified, hopefully it'll be released to the public. And Mr. Weeks has got a follow on question. Can you share how you were able to fund this serious undertaking? And I think we could also add to that very illuminating very valuable in terms of understanding another aspect of our history. So Mr. Weeks would like to inquire if you could share how you were able to fund the production of the film. Was it self-funded or did you receive a grant funding or other finances? Uh, well, I, I cut the credits short because I knew time was going, but if I let the credits run at the end of the film, 
you would have seen the number of uh, institutions that uh, contributed to the making of the film. Uh, Department of National Defense uh, de uh, donated uh, a big time for the film. Uh, Veteran Affairs Canada donated to the film. The Millennium Bureau of Canada donated to the film. Uh, Canadian Heritage, uh, Department of Canadian Heritage uh, contributed to the film. Uh, despite all those generous contributions, uh, I still ran short. Film is one of the, is the most expensive medium in which to tell stories. Mm -hmm. Producing film is extremely expensive. And uh, with all those contributions from the various levels of government, it amounted to about $350,000, which I was about $75,000 still short, which eventually had to come out of my pocket. Um, but uh, I was willing to do that because it was important. It was an important story to tell. Um, it was, uh, you know, reading the war diary and reading the words from my great uncle, you, can, you could feel the pain in his words. You could mm -hmm. feel the agony and the torment. And uh, it took me a long time to get funding for the film because initially, a lot of uh, some of the, the government uh, agencies didn't want the story to come out. They felt it was a black mark towards Canadian history, but I, I impressed upon them that it wasn't my intention to embarrass anybody. It was my intention to prove and show that black Canadian men served, bled and died for their country and made significant contributions to the First World War in Canada. And that was my, my objective of my film. And so uh, finding financing for film is extremely difficult, even in, even in Canada. But uh, I was very uh, thankful and blessed that I was able to pull the, those finances together to get the film done. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Sherwood. A comment and a question has come in from Mr. Stephen Deiter. Mr. Deiter is from the Directorate of His History and Heritage, the Department of National Defense in Ottawa, Canada. And he says, firstly, Mr. Sherwood, as a fellow Canadian, thank you for your work in producing this excellent, this masterpiece of, of film. Many would never know that the composition of the number two construction battalion was buried and that this continued into the Second World War. The question Mr. Deiter poses is to me, and he asks, hearing how the number two construction battalion was treated, how do you feel about that compared to how the British West Indies Regiment served with all the battle honors it earned for all the areas it served throughout the First World War? Mm -hmm. And if I could attempt to give uh, some response to that, I think viewing the film and putting it in, in frame with, as Mr. Deiter asked, the contribution of the B British West Indies Regiment in places like North Africa, it fills me with a similar sense of understanding of the mountain of courage it took Caribbean people, Barbadians, Grenadians, Jamaicans, Trinidadians, Guyanese, the courage it took for us to really show faith, to show steadfastness and certainly teamwork in the face of what we have read about, we've, we've seen it uh, shown here on film, but we understand in a very special way. So I think I take particular courage from what was illustrated here and the courage of our forefathers in the military service and how they allowed their strengths to be the winner over man who at times, and as we've seen here as well, was very prejudiced and forced one into the pits of despair. Mr. Blind Husbands, who shares my first name, is curious about when the Canadian Armed Forces were desegregated and black men permitted to serve in all branches, meaning the army, the air force, and the navy, unable to fight. I don't know if Mr. Sherwood 
you might be able to respond to Mr. Husband's, going husband's question. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I, I know that in the Second World War, uh, men, uh, black men were, were refused uh, entry, for example, in the Air Force, but eventually they let them in. Uh, but uh, it, it, there was still difficulty in the Second World War uh, when blacks tried to enlist. Uh, today, there is a, 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 um, a very active and uh, vibrant a recruitment policy in the Canadian military to hire people, uh, people of color, uh, a, a diversity program uh, within the Canadian military to hire, hiring people or recruiting people from all backgrounds. Uh, and uh, uh, it, 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 it's, 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 an on, it's an ongoing struggle uh, because even uh, as mentioned earlier, even when they are allowed in, uh, they face racial discrimination. So uh, it's a, it's a two-edged sword. Uh, you finally allow them to get in, but when they do get in, they're experiencing some racial discrimination. So that is one of the things that the Canadian military is trying to rectify. Um, uh, Colonel Granham, if I may. Yes, ma'am. I would like to um, recall, and again, I, wouldn't, I would not clear any sort of expertise in terms of military history. But two things come to mind based on the questions asked and the responses given. That in, in, in the second place, uh, with, with respect to World War II, we might recall that um, the uh, late, the Right Honorable Errol Barrow did his, uh, Air Force training or did part of it in Canada at, at a certain point in time. Not to say, of course, he was recruited in Barbados. He was, however, doing train, military training in Canada before he finally um, went on to Great Britain. Um, and, and Jeff, and I, I would like you to back me up here in terms of World War I. While, while we might have seen some distinction in terms of the treatment of the British West India Regiment, it certainly, I, I certainly can recall that at one stage, those black troops were the ones that were being left behind in Europe uh, when everybody else was being, um, you know, demobbed back to, back to Britain. And um, the black men were left uh, to do a mopping up job. Eventually, eventually they, at, virtually at the end of their service, and I think it was 1919, 1918, 1919, they revolted. The end result was that those men who had done huge, a huge periods of time of military service were neglected, were not mentioned on the monuments that were raised to World War I um, soldiers. Jeff, you could probably say a bit more than I can on this matter. I would be grateful if you could clean that up. I'm happy to, Alessandra. First off, um, Prime Minister Barrow was part of the ETSC Empire Training Scheme where the RAF had the training in the fair weather Canada and then came over. Um, what you're talking about is absolutely right. Um, it was in Toronto, in Italy, and there were two primary reasons. Um, the first was the, the British West Indian Regiment troops were left behind. The second was they found out that white soldiers had gotten a pay raise when they hadn't. So there were, there were two main items, but the troops that that rose up, they fought in, in um, supporting positions, those battalions in France. They were at, at Passchendaele, at the Somme, at Ypres, um, in, in some of the hardest fighting that there was. And at the end of the war, they, they were sent to Italy, to Toronto, with the same units as the first and second regiments that were 
fighting um, the Turkish forces. And the two things happened. Number one, they, they, they were not given the increase in pay that their white counterparts were. And number two, they were not sent home. I think one soldier was executed, one got 20 years, some got five years, but one of the, the travesties of it is some of them never made it home because some of these soldiers um, were sent to Cuba and they were sent to other, other places in South America and they were actually never demobbed back home to their countries. Right, thank you. Uh, a question is coming from Mr. Martin Cox, who asks, did the Canadian authorities learn anything from the treatment of Black Canadians in World War I, and as a result, provided better treatment to Black Canadians during World War II? Well, as I, as I mentioned, uh, when World War II came out, uh, a lot of Black Canadian men were experiencing the same kind of racial discrimination. Uh, and it was very difficult for them to, to, get, to, to get into the Air Force. Uh, eventually they did allow them. Uh, same thing in the Navy. Uh, they, uh, in the, when the Second World War broke out, uh, Black men had trouble uh, enlisting in the Navy as well. So they didn't learn too much from the First World War. Today, uh, they, from this report that was issued this morning by the Minister of Defense of Canada, they realize there's a problem. And they realize that the problem still exists today. And uh, it seems like uh, from this report that they are willing to try and rectify and eliminate the amount of racial discrimination that exists. I just wanted to comment uh, also on Alessandra's comments about uh, and your, your comments, uh, Colonel Granham, uh, about uh, the bravery of Caribbean men to come to Canada to serve. You have to understand that these were men who were willing to go to a strange country and fight on behalf of that country. And it took a great amount of courage and uh, um, the ability of these men to want or the the desire of these men to want to contribute to fight in the first world war and that sort of patriotism that sort of courage has to be acknowledged and recognized the other thing is is that there were men from barbados who were already living in nova scotia as Al alessandra uh pointed out uh, men from Barbados were, were coming to Canada as far back as the late 1800s to work in the fisheries and to work in the mines. And specifically in, uh, in, in, uh, in Sydney, Nova Scotia, where the coal mines were, there was a great many men from Barbados who worked the coal mines. So when the First World War broke out and when Canada finally allowed men to join and form the number two construction battalion, those men from Barbados who were working in the coal mines in Sydney uh, were already there. When you look at their military records, you see that some of, they gave addresses and, uh, and also their, their wives were uh, uh, Canadian. And uh, it, it gave you an idea that these men had been, had been living in Nova Scotia for a while, even though their, their birthplace was Barbados. So uh, Canada has had a long, a relationship with Barbados in terms of uh, early migration to Canada from the men of Barbados and contributing to, to the industries of Canada, uh, like mining and fisheries. Thank you for that addition, Mr. Sherwood. Are there any other uh, questions? I'm seeing lots of comments complimentary to the presentation, the excellent quality of the production. One in particular says, thank you, Mr. Sherwood, on a documentary, well done. It was educational and painful. And thank you for the comments there coming there from. Uh, additionally, uh, Ms. Grant, Kathy Grant advises that there were a total of five blacks in the 
Royal Canadian Navy during the Second World War. And certainly that information would help to situate some of our research. Uh, but the floor, the floor remains open for any other questions or uh, comments. Uh, Alessandra? Yes, thank you, uh, Colonel Granham. I think um, that uh, some of the points that uh, Shani has made and that others um from the floor have made is the importance of opportunities for group reflection around these particular points just imagine if anthony sherwood had not read his great uncle's diary would we have had this opportunity i don't think so or we might have had this opportunity in another hundred years while the records became digitized and while people moved further and further distances away. So I think it's extremely important that we recognize the value of film to help us visualize what these situations might mean and how people's lives came to be completely shifted and changed. And then we see the importance of the archives, the, the importance of being able to access the archives, but also we see the importance of how, how critical it is to knowledgeably interrogate those archives and to be able to pull out frames of reference to be able to pull out patterns of behavior because it is this it is the knowledge of human behavior and cultural and social practices that help us to be able to tell our true story i'd like um in the end if if we could give chair with your uh with your um indulgence if you could give uh, Consul General, the opportunity to perhaps reflect on some of what's gone forward because the museum and I know the archives as well as the ministry will be looking at um, circulating this information much more broadly and seeking to carry out Mr. Sherwood's grand task because we are intending to find these not just the 42 or 44 Barbadians, but the 73 Caribbean men, we are going to find them. We're going to find their families. And we need to do, the only way we can do that is by sharing information. So I would, I would like to suggest that we hear from the Consul General. Yes, ma'am, and I indeed agree. Madam Consul General. Hi, yes, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, are you hearing me? Yes, please, we are. Hearing. Okay, great. Because um, I am not wearing my mic at this, at this point in time. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity to say a few words. Um, excellent film. Uh, Mr. Sherwood would have come to us um, sometime. It would have been last year, I think, Mr. Sherwood, when we would have first met. Uh, online, of course, and I would have put him on to our, at the time, Minister of Culture, uh, Senator John King now, and we would have met with the National Cultural Foundation and, and others, and I was so happy um, when I did get the report that he was going to be a part of the film festival, and, and I was extremely excited about that, and yes, we will continue to do our research here. Only today, actually, I had gotten an email from Montreal and Kathy Grant, who I see is on, on the, um, on, on the um, call today, she would have sent information through another one of our Barbadians in Montreal with um, some details about the Barbadian men and some statistics and so forth, which I will pass on as well. If y'all don't already have them, I will pass on to the archives and all others involved as well. Um, it was very useful information, I thought, and it was timely, I told them, because, you know, we were having, there was going to be this um, session later. 
So um, I'm sorry that I wasn't there, Mr. Sherwood. I had promised that I would have been there when things were supposed to happen in February. I had promised to be there. And I was in Barbados in February, but um, not during that period of time when it worked out. So um, just, just want to say that we have been doing some research here and I have one of my consuls, Consul David Gibbs, is very eager. He's a great historian and he's very eager to do some research. And, and we're, like I said, we're quite willing to work with our Barbadian community and the researchers in general in, in Canada who would be interested in researching this genealogy and unearthing other uh, facts and information um, because it is, it is just extremely important to us and our history. And of course, as we celebrate our national, um, national heroes this month, we're having an unsung heroes award um, well, 11 of them actually coming up on Saturday, and we would like to do something big for next year. And that was one of the questions that the Barbadians asked, like, how are we going to tie this in to our Unsung Hero Awards? So I really would, would like to, um, like I said, offer the support, of course, of the consulate here. Whatever we can do, please let us know, because we will continue to work with you and continue to help research and whatever we need to do from this end to ensure that we have accurate records and we can locate these people and, and maybe others because we do have a good set of information on those who would have come over from Barbados to Nova Scotia, like you said, back in the 18, um, late 1800s and, um, and the nurses who would have come in the very early 1900s and so forth. So we do have some information. So looking forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. And I can't help but feel a sense of the impetus and the energy of this project growing as we are able to trade ideas and share information and that energy that will take this to even greater levels of success. A question is coming for Mr. Sherwood and it comes from Ms. Janice Mears. How much of the testimony of the soldiers themselves might you have been able to retrieve? Um, it, uh, my film is, is really based on my great uncle's war diary. Um, there, were, uh, there was an, an uh, enormous amount of work done by Senator Calvin Ruck, who appears in my film. He was a very close friend of my family. Um, actually, the day I was born, he and his wife helped bring me into the world. Uh, and uh, he wrote a book called The Black Battalion, Canada's Best Kept Military Secret. And he did an enormous amount of research uh, for his book. And he recorded testimonies from soldiers, Canadian soldiers, uh, when, they, when they were still alive back in the early 1980s. So he had transcripts uh, from some of those soldiers of what they experienced uh, while serving with number two construction battalion. I just wanted to, to mention that, uh, thank Alessandra for the comments that my film <laughs> brought to light the story, but yes, film does, can dramatize and bring to light, but before any film has to be done, it needs a script, it needs a text. And it is often said that the pen is mightier than the sword. If my great uncle didn't take the time to write that war diary and, and he wrote every single day and he wrote everything that he saw and everything that was happening to those young black men. If he didn't take the time and the courage to do that, I wouldn't have been inspired to do the film. So I owe it all to him. I owe it all to him and the, the people before me who like Senator Calvin Ruck, who did a lot of the groundwork. I mean, uh, my great uncle, the, the interesting thing is, is that the, the Black Battalion, the number two construction battalion landed in France on May 17, 1917. Yet the first entry into the diary isn't until October, 1917. And something tells me that my great uncle, when he arrived in France, he saw what was happening to those black soldiers. And he said, I better write this down. I better record what is happening. And I think that is the most important thing in this whole story is his courage to write that down in a diary.
Uh, Mr. Sherwood, I had a similar question, if I may share, I had a similar question about the some of the footage that you were using, because I think even though your uncle's diary was the um, around I was a main resource, the main source, um, in terms of um, the, uh, just to clarify, the recordings of the other person speaking, that, is that the, the research done prior that you got permission to use or you were able to actually interview some persons as well? It, it, unless I, because I, I noticed that even, and I thought it was really brilliant use of that, sorry, as I said, no, brilliant use of photographs that are not necessarily on the, the black battalion itself, but help to tell this larger, provide that kind of overarching context, which I think is generally missing when we try to think about the um, West Indian mutiny, World War One, that led to the disbandment of the British West India Regiment. Like if a similar documentary was done to kind of show the tensions, I think it'd be great. But yes, answering the initial question, go ahead. Yeah, it's, uh, I have the research done of the statements and you saw the actual letters that were written by the Canadian government and the, and the, the, the racial slurs that they used. Mm -hmm. They weren't afraid to call us niggers. They weren't afraid to call us darkies in government letters. Mm -hmm. And those were sitting in the archives for anybody's use to see. Mm -hmm. And so when I did the research and pulled these letters out and said, first of all, I said, oh my God, they weren't afraid to show their, their racial discrimination in public like that. And, I, and so I hired actors to use the voice. What would those voices sound like? What, what, what kind of voice would be used to that particular person, citing? And the same thing went for the black men who were, uh, who were giving transcripts of what they experienced and what had happened, like when they went to, to sign up for, to enlist and the long line of, of black men who were told to go away. I tried to use, find the actors' voices for those black men. And they had to be of a certain quality. They had to be of a certain age. They couldn't be too young, and 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 that's part of the 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 um, the art of filmmaking, if you want, in terms of trying to bring those characters to life, mm -hmm. so that people could understand that particular particular period and time uh, of what the thinking was for people in those situations. Thank you, Mr. Sherwood. Are there any further uh, questions? The question and answer box is empty. I think we've responded to all that were posted there as well as in the chat. Uh, so uh, making a last call for any contributions that might still be out there. Good afternoon. Yes, please. I'm going to take up the offer. I could not find where to type the question. So I put it in the chat, but you didn't see. Okay. From a preservation perspective, I'm trying to find out how the diary is being permanently preserved. Excellent question, uh, Karen. The, after I made the, uh, the film, I returned the diary. The diary was given to me by my great uncle's, his son, Lauren White, who appears in the documentary, who talks about his father. So I returned the diary to him and he donated the diary to the archives, the Library and Archives Canada. So anybody can go online and read the diary. And uh, if you're interested in doing that, just log on to Library and Archives Canada and look up the war diary of William Andrew White and uh, you'll be able to read his diary. And also, all the narration in the film, most of the narration, all the poetic narration in the film was words from his diary. Yeah. I mean, he had, he had such a, uh, a gift. He had this ability to transport you back in time by painting these vivid images using these poetic and eloquent words. And so the narration that I used in the film was my great uncle's words. Wonderful, very, very, very excellent indeed. 
Are there any comments, closing remarks from any member of the panel or the other members of the panel? Mr. Ward, Ms. Proverbs, Ms. Thompson. If I, if I may, Colonel Graham, I'd like to say again, Mr. Sherwood, while film might be the most expensive medium and to, to go on what Alessandra was saying, it's also probably the most effective medium to disseminate information. And where I think a film like this is extremely critical is it gets, it piques people's interest that they, they're learning something new and it will then lead to further investigations and them doing further investigations and becoming more interested. So while again, it, it, it might be a very expensive method, it, it, I think it's an unbelievably effective method as well. And just wanted to say thank you again for doing it. Yes, I also want to say thanks to everyone. We look forward to working with everyone um, with this project and in terms of it help us to understand our, our social history. So, so much parts of our, our history and so on that we can learn um, through this project. And it's sort of given us a, a new impetus to reach out to get copies of some of these documents and so on um, to be preserved in the Barbados archives so that our locals can have free access to come and consult some of these sources. I heard the Consul General mention that they have information in terms of um, persons uh, migrating to um, Nova Scotia and so on, but those documents that are on the Canadian side that we can obtain copies of them to be preserved in our archives for current generate current persons and future generations so that our history would never be lost. Mm -hmm. And you know, I always say that um, before we heard the term um, globalization, that Barbados was global long before globalization because you can find a Beijing anywhere in the world. So we just have to put it together and fit it into the context, but we, we have a place on, on world history on the stage. And I think we need to tell these stories and, and many more. So I want to thank everyone. Very, very well said. Uh, just a quick running question here. Uh, Mr. Sherwood, would the history you mentioned on the internet, would that be, available in a podcast for the hearing impaired. Would you be aware of that? Uh, I'm sorry, which, which information? The, the diary, would that be available as a podcast for the hearing impaired? Or... Uh, I, I'm not sure, I don't think so. I think it's, 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 it's a document file. So okay. it's something that you could read. Uh, okay. There's, um, I don't believe that there is any audio to that. To that okay. uh, to that file. Uh, Dr. Roper, any closing comments? Um, no, I, I think um, I think the event and the the film really just puts, you know, just kind of reinforces the importance of documenting of um, and of celebrating and of memorializing. Um, our ancestors, and also um, the fact that this is moving towards an apology. And I think this mm -hmm. is, I think the most important, um, it's a tangible um, legacy um, coming out of this because in, in many ways, what people are avoiding are the apologies, mm -hmm. right? And the legacy of trauma that has been inflicted on, on persons of African descent, regardless of, the context and the geographical location. So I think this is a very just important um, project and you know, I'll do my best to on my end to provide support where I can. Thank you. And indeed, I'm sure we could all agree that the apology helps the healing and the understanding as well. Uh, Sir Trevor, would you like to provide any closing comments? Sir, please. I only closing comments would be to echo a former governor of the Central Bank here in Barbados. And he, he I, I think I mentioned maybe sometime before, he was very quietly engaged in transcendental meditation. 
and very reflective. And I couldn't dare aspire to be as effective as he was. But after such a satisf satisfying performance such as this, he was wont to say, well, the Maharishi has spoken. There's nothing left to be said. And I, I think that's all I can say at this stage. Uh, the Maharishis have spoken and there's really nothing left to be said. It's, it's been a wonderful evening, informative, engaging, and with good work for us to do and to move forward steadily and happily doing it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Senator, the Honorable John King, sir, would you, if you would be so. Thank you. I think, I think one of the things that that I would, would wish to share is I think Dr. Roper basically spoke about it, and that is the other side of the story, the trauma. Um, if we if we stop and think about what the families, especially for those who would have been murdered in France, um, I don't believe that communication going back to those families would have been as effective as one would have liked it to be. And so this this process of finding these families, even though some of, some of the closer relatives may have passed on, would be also very healing for people. And I, and, I, and I think there's a lot more to this project than just the historical value of it, but there are psychological things in my mind um, that will benefit not only us as the persons who, who, who are watching it, but those families who probably didn't even know a lot of these stories of their relatives. So um, again, uh, Mr. Sherwood, I, I don't know if I have the words to thank you on behalf of those persons, but I do thank you. Thank you, sir. And in closing, may I add my own uh, thanks and appreciation to the producer, director, and the enabler of the project, Mr. Sherwood, and indeed to the research team, the director and staff of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. It has indeed been, an, been an, a very educational evening, one that we've had another look into aspects of our past or history. And to be able to understand courage, to be un, able to understand yet again the scale of war, why it should be avoided at all costs, and why our servicemen, our Caribbean brothers, have been called in noble service to the world. And certainly that we must treasure their memory, value their contributions, and do everything to build upon what they have sacrificed and given to us. So I thank all concerned for a very, very rich and valuable and memorable evening. Just a reminder as we close this evening's proceedings, to reach out, to communicate, to continue to network as part of the project in locating the descendants and to provide that information to the Barbados archives or to the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. Indeed, the fusion of our minds and of our email addresses and WhatsApp contact details this afternoon is a valuable asset in achieving the further goals of this project and those that are to come. So I close this forum at this stage with thanks to all, and I wish that you have a pleasant evening and enjoy, for those of us resident in Barbados, enjoy the pleasant showers that we are receiving at this time. Thanks, good evening, and please do have a pleasant and safe evening. I thank you. Thank, thank you, you very all. much, Chair. Thank you all. Thank you. And thanks very much, Anthony. Good to see you again and looking forward to seeing you another time. And thank you very much also the archive team and Shani. Thank you mm -hmm. very much for contributions. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.